science knowledge only adds to the excitement and mystery and the awe of a flower. Evidence is evidence. It's public. Everybody can look at the evidence and assess it and eventually, if there's an enough evidence, come to the same conclusion. <laughs> the Chloe Sanctuary hopes to give you insight into the health and happiness of your companion parrots. We hope to help you build happy homes using reliable and proven tools. The best homes are built on a rock-solid foundation. And the best foundation for a happy home is the bedrock of science. When we stand on the shoulders of giants, the scientists who have worked long and diligently to understand our companions, we can reach new heights of understanding. And understanding is the key to success. I think treated, most of these birds have a good prognosis, and I would say in... What does avian veterinary medicine have to tell us about our feathered friends? How can the tools of behavior shaping make our homes happier for us and our companions? Shape. How can we deal with biting, screaming, or other misbehavior? What is it like to live among parrots? Let them roam around about you and share a life with them. Of the Chloe Sanctuary for Parrots and Cockatoos, a nonprofit charity dedicated to the empowerment of captive parrots and public awareness. Hi, and welcome to Cockatoo, Cockatoos with Attitude, episode 84, How Well Do You Know Your Parrot? With us today, we have Babalu and Cecil, who haven't been getting along well lately, but we'll see how that works out. Pip, Pip, Pippa, who likes the Steve Jobs poster so much. And we have Coco, and Lorelei, <laughs> Salamander, and Sugar. It's a big crew, isn't it, Bob? I tried to bring in Snowball, but he decided he wanted to see how much of the room he could tear up. They're not used to this. This is something new. You know, anytime you add something new, you get situations, right? So I added this cover for the couch and uh, although they all showed a little dislike of it, Snowball was doing the flying tear up the place routine so it got to be quite a mess in here. Didn't it Bob? He even knocked the, the uh, part of the window frame off. Yeah, that's the way it goes. There isn't something to fix around here. I don't feel like I'm doing anything, right? Right Bob? So how well do you know your parrot? Well, I've had Chloe for about, what, three years? And I thought I knew her pretty well, just to give you some examples here. I thought I knew her pretty well, and I was at the Ren Renaissance Fair with some friends, and they had their parrots with them. And uh, thanks, Bob, I needed that white coating. I, you know, I don't feel normal unless I have a white coating on my shirt. That's right. What are you looking at her for? You're not going to mess with her. So anyway, they had some millet. And they were going to, you know, they're offering it to their umbrella cockatoo. And they said, you think Chloe would like some? I said, she won't touch it. She, anytime I'd offered her millet, she'd just turn her head away and do the whole, don't you go after him and do the whole, uh, I don't want any part of this. I said, oh no, she won't eat it. So of course she, grabbed a piece of it from them, went right over and started eating it. So the, the thing is, you think you know what they'll do. You think you know what their behaviors are going to be, but you don't really know. Not in all circumstances. You might know maybe 90% or 95% of what their behavior is going to be. Leave him alone, please. Don't stare at him. He doesn't like it. Of course, she doesn't understand what I'm saying, but she does know that I don't want her to do something. Where are you going, Cecil? Oh, bird. Yeah, I really wanted Snowball in here, but unfortunately, you never know with something new how they're going to react, and it was all over the place. I might put a little clip of the flight of the uh, crazy Snowball at the end. But anyway, um, 
I was also at the, this is another incident at the Ren Fair. A friend of mine had her green wing macaw there, and I was standing behind her, and her parrot was next to me. She was saying, oh, my bird won't let anyone else hold it. It absolutely refuses. It'll bite anyone who tries to pick it up. So I just kind of put my arm down and said, hey, come on over. And for a while she's talking, that's nice. That was a nice flight there, kid. What are you doing? Come on, Coco. What are you doing, Coco? Come on, Coco. Come on. What you doing? What you doing, Coco Bird? Leave her alone. No. 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 Okay. This is not going to work. Come here. Come on. Bob. Bob. Bob a loop. Peppa, cut it out. I'm going to be using, while we're talking about this today, I'm going to be using a technique that I learned from an Applied Behavior Analysis podcast that's used with children who are autistic and appears to be quite effective. Um, I'll explain this in our little uh, tidbit. We have our little section about training. We'll explain what I'm doing. But as you can see, these two birds that don't get along seem to be uh, okay right now. So I put my arm out, and he stepped right up on my arm. And while she's talking, he's saying, "Oh, he won't be, you know, he won't let anyone hold him." The people started chuckling, and he, she turned around, and there I am holding this bird on my arm. So we think we know what they're going to do. As they say, it ain't necessarily so. And when Coco, this one here, came, they said she was kind of shy and she didn't, you know, she didn't really like being around other birds. And as you can see, she's terribly shy now. She's really having a problem being around these other birds. So did they know their bird? Well, they knew her in that circumstance. I think you broke a feather. Did we break a feather? Did we? All right. What are you doing? You can't have the whole bag. It's not happening. Now, I've taken Dr. Friedman's LLA, Living and Learning with Animals class, which is specifically targeting how to work with parrots using applied behavior analysis. And I've worked with birds ever since, and they still continue to surprise me. I would not have expected Coco to go flying towards the door. It surprised me. Now, sitting on my chest like this and looking me in the eyes and wanting to be petted, I expect that. But not flying to the door. That's not something she's done before. Right, Coco? I know. She can fly. Hold on. Bob, I'll give you one. Pip, you can have one. Now, I'll tell you, I don't normally give them treats like this on a regular basis, okay? Well, he's not going to take it now. I don't normally give them treats like this. And it's all part of a, uh, something that works quite well. And if you've got birds that don't, that don't get along, you might find this to be a useful technique. Um, so, every bird that came in here, what are you doing? Leave her alone. You want one? All right. Every bird that came in here had, had a personality, a personality, and it continued to morph over time. So do I know these parrots? I would say yes and no. I usually know just about how far they will go in a certain situation. 
I know how far I can go with them in various situations. And I kind of know how to do a high wire act. And when I'm doing these videos, I am doing a high wire act because I've got birds here that have issues one to another. And I'm dealing with that situation while I'm dealing with something I'm trying to talk about. So uh, I should appear a little more distracted than I think. Oh, a beautiful song, Peaches! A beautiful song, Peaches! That's a beautiful song. Oh, that's a beautiful song. Hello. Hello, baby. Hello. How's my peach? How's Hello. my peach? Hello. They will tend to try to go a little farther Hello. with me when I'm in a situation like this. Because they, they know I'm distracted. Hello. And once you're distracted, it's easier to manipulate you. So when you say, do, I, do you know your parrot? Or do I know the parrots around me? There are certain, you know, there are various things you can know about them. Um, there doesn't seem to be, and this may seem weird to some of you, but there doesn't seem to be any violence in them at all. I mean, these are prey animals. These are not predators. They don't go around killing things for a living. Um, human beings are predators. They kill things for a living. Uh, every time you go to the grocery store and you pick up that package with meat in it, you're part of the killing process, okay? There's a parrot recently found in Mexico called the blue-winged Amazon parrot. It tends to be noisier than its relatives, but it does make an interesting sound. This is a parrot that makes a sound like a hawk. It was discovered in the Yucatan in Mexico. It wasn't known to science until a few years ago. Now we know that the, the African gray makes so many sounds because it does tend to imitate predators in the wild. But now we found another parrot that specifically mimics hawks. It has distinctive behavior, plumage, and I'm sure if it was flying around here, our birds would be somewhat frightened by that sound. Thank you to those of you who make one-time donations. Without these patrons giving us of their hard-earned cash, we couldn't continue doing this podcast. We are predators. These guys are not. They're vegetarians. Um... More like vegans, because they don't eat dairy products. Uh, all right, let's not get into that. No, we're not going to fight. <laughs> don't laugh at me. It's not funny. And although I learned about territoriality in books, I have experienced it. Right here, if, if any bird gets over here, sits next to me on this side, he's territorial about it. 
and it's only this little section over here he's territorial about. He'll sometimes spill over into other areas and try to play room monitor. It's something he will do. So when you do see what seems to be aggression, it's territoriality, and in most cases, it's based on relationship rules in, in mating, okay? So some, you've petted your bird improperly, it's gotten mated to you, and now it's doing territorial mating behavior. Are we singing, Peaches? Are we singing over here? Oh, we're singing? I'm not going to bring you over here because that's too hard to manage with Bob in the room. No, he tries to get you. I don't know why he's doing that. But how are you doing? Peach? Peaches? Peachy girl? How you doing, baby? You okay? Well, hello. How are you doing? Hello. Hello. Hello, beautiful. She went on, hello. She went on an outing this morning. So she's a little more involved in everything going on. Hello. Hello. And as Beecha says, hello, how do you know anyone? Okay. Hello. You know their bodies. That's how you recognize them, right? The way they express themselves um, and their behavior. And when they do something that's outside of what you expect as behavior, usually you're shocked, okay? Uh, if you have somebody who normally doesn't drink and all of a sudden you see them like, drunk, it's, it's, it doesn't seem like the same person. But um, they change like we do, mostly based on reactions to their environment and their personal history. Peachy girl, you're just singing a lot. Hello. Hello, baby. You're singing a lot today. Hello. Hello. So they change based on reactions to their environment, to outside circumstances, and to their health. So to start knowing anyone, you need to be around them. You need to engage with them and pay attention to their behavior and give them the space to be so they can be so they can act out in the way that they normally do right coco we hope you will consider supporting us on patreon today we produce up to two videos a month as a patron you pledge to give us a donation and Patreon gives us your gift monthly. You can easily set a limit on how much you donate a month. You can change the amount of your pledge at any time. Your gift will allow us to continue bringing you entertaining and informative videos. Patreon.com forward slash Chloe Sanctuary. We look forward to your participation in Cockatude. Yeah, eh. Coco being needy today. Coco being needy. Uh, it's hard enough to know people around you, let alone to know aliens from another world. And although they come from the earth like we do, they are quite different than us. Their body, 
Their mind, their behavior is nothing like us, or mammals in general. Uh, some people make the mistake of thinking them as kids. They call them feathered kids or fids, but nothing could be f further from the truth. How many children have you known that became sexually active at five when we're looking for mates? And the larger ones of these guys to live, live to be 80 years old, but they go through adolescence at three and become adults at five. Um, for the smaller birds, it's a little earlier. We don't know any kids like that. Okay. We don't know any kids that at six months or a year old want to take off and fly in the sky. So sometimes we think we know them, but we, we really don't. And believe me, I think I'm lucky if I've got 80 to 85 percent of any one of these guys' behavior. I'm not completely shocked by anything that might they might do. And usually I can trace back a behavior to uh, something I have learned about them. And if I don't understand what, I j what just happened, I can look back on it and analyze it and see what the, what the circumstances were that led to a particular behavior. This one's not hungry, so one of the technique I'm trying to use right on him right now is not working so well. But because she's staying calm, he's calm. What kids do you know that were ripped out of their mother's wombs when they were just little zygotes, incubated in machines, and then raised by chimpanzees? That's a good analogy to what happened to these guys. So because of the way they were raised, they're functionally autistic. They're going to do some unusual things based on what they would do in the wild. Stop that. Leave her alone. Here, Pip, why don't you move this way a little bit? Move over here a little bit. <laughs> now, even though what we can know about them is extremely limited, cognitive scientists have said that birds are self-aware. Okay, they, they are aware of who they are. They realize that they are beings, like we do. <clears throat> They're on the list of animals that, that fit that bill, and parrots especially so. See, what are the ways we can know about our birds. One is body language. For example, if I'm looking at Coco, it's not so likely with Coco, but it's more likely with him. He doesn't, she doesn't do this much, but he does. The feathers on just right back here, these feathers come up, okay? Only the feathers behind the neck. That's generally territorial aggression. I, depending on old world parrots, oval versus round eyes, yeah, we traded Babalu for for uh, Lucy. Hi, Luce. Hi, Lucy. As Bob was just, uh, he's had a lot of problems lately. He's doing okay in the in the aviary, but when he's in this room, he gets a little aggressive. And because Pippa just wants to sit up on my lap, it wasn't working out. He kept going after her. So, so if the feathers behind the neck come up, the eyes are no longer round. They turn more oval. Those are signs of aggression. Now remember, they're not aggressive like us. You know, they don't run and catch an animal, kill it, and eat it. They don't do that. So it's not, that's not their way. So generally, they're protecting their territory or protecting a mate. Now, you may say they don't have a mate, but you might be that mate because you've been petting them improperly or otherwise leading them to want to bond with you. Right, Coco? Yes, Coco? Are you sure, Coco? And you can tell a lot by body posture. Right now, she's she'll normally stay as long as I pet her. But if I stop petting her a little bit, then she'll just take off and she won't stay on me. She'll go off and get on the perch or you know, deal with deal with Lorelei or hang out with Cecil or do something like that. Again, how well do I know them? I know them, like I say, maybe 80-85% of their behavior. Now, you can know their bodies. I mean, how far can that leg actually stretch? You'd be surprised. Cecil reaches down, and uh, Snowball reached down through the bars on their cage, and I don't know how they stretch that far, because you're talking like five inches down to the paper, and they'll get a hold of an edge of paper and pull it through, and then just rip all the paper in the cage up. Um, there'll be no paper underneath anymore. 
And you know, these guys who designed these cages, they figured the length of that leg, it's not going to be able to reach that. But they're amazing. They have go-go gadget legs, don't you? Hmm? What are you trying to do? Eat my, my glasses? Is that what you're trying to do, Lucy? In our last episode, we talked about using a mop head to clean the bottom of the cage. But there's another cute thing we found. It's this Super Pet Brush Wire Bar and Grate Cleaner. It actually has four little brushes that are all tied together. And what I did is I put this on a dowel that's two feet long so that I can just reach into a cage and brush it. I also found that if you spray some poop off on it, just before you do this, it really does a great job of cleaning those bars. And don't forget, when you're cleaning bars, you can see what needs to be cleaned generally, okay? And that's by looking down at the paper. When you see poop down below, you know the bars right above that need to be cleaned. So we do have to pull those bars out and clean them fairly regularly, but this does help to keep that underside clean. So uh, this is available on Amazon and just put in Super Pet Brush Wire Bar and you'll find it. So you learn their bodies, and then you learn about their beaks, which aren't what we, at first people think. People think they're just static. They have a, it's a beak that just kind of stays there and doesn't grow, but of course they do grow, and they do have nerves in their beaks. So they can feel you petting their beaks. Like we can feel somebody touching our fingers, and that's not at all what you would expect. Um, most people don't realize that they have a bone in their tongue. Their tongue is more like a finger. It has intrinsic and extrinsic muscles in it. So it's more like a finger along with the bone. That's why they can do so many wild things with their tongues. And that they have, they zip their, their feathers together. If the feather come, becomes separated, it zips together. It has like a built-in zipper. So, um, these are things you learn over time with two things, study and observation. Right? What are you doing, Pip? Pip's trying to take off. Maybe I can get her attention. Pippa! No, I don't want you going over there. Come on, Pip. Pippa! Pip, Pip. Come on, Pip. Come on, Pip, Pip. Come on, Pip, Pip. I don't want you on the floor. It's not a good place for you. Because usually she goes to the... Now, again, this is what I think she's going to do, but there's no guarantee. She'll get on the floor, and then she'll climb over and climb up onto one of the tripods. That's what she will do frequently, not every time, okay? So you learn about their, their uh, physical body. Their skin is only three layers thick, and in some places only seven cells deep, so it's pretty thin. But they have a tremendous amount of dust that they create. Old salamander over there will rouse. Usually he'll rouse and shake his body out. He likes to do that before he poops, too. So he'll shake himself out. And if you've got like a shaft of light going by, you can't believe the dust that goes in the air. And their digestive system is different than ours. They have a crop where they pre-digest food. And also they feed each other from there. So, uh, yeah, they throw up when they're sick, but most of the time when food comes back up, they're just regurgitating it to offer it to, to you or to another bird. Um, they also have a gland back here called, right above the tail called the uropageal gland. <clears throat> and these guys, you're going to watch that thing too because they don't need it so much. Their feather dust protects them so they don't need that oil that's there like the old world parrots do. They can rub that gland and get oil and then coat their feathers with it. You won't see cockatoos do that much, but you will see parrots do it. Right, guys? And they have these interesting feet. Right, these zygodactyl feet, which work like this. They open and close like this, but they're opposing so they can grab a spoon or they can pick things up. Yeah, if you saw a dog do that, you'd freak out because dogs can't pick up things with their feet. They use their mouths. 
but these guys... Ow! Oh, never preen her when she's right next to your ear. That's one way to get go deaf. I'm sorry, sweetie. I didn't mean to hurt you. You got me back, though. My ear's ringing. It is kind of like having a bullet go off or a gun go off right next to your ear. There's a lot of things you can learn about their bodies. They have hollow bones and have air sacs. The air comes in and goes out in one loop. They don't hold dead air inside them like we do. They couldn't fly if they held dead air inside them. You can eat my glasses. First you deafen me, then you eat my glasses, right? We have a fight or flight response. They have more of a flight or fight response. So if you take away their ability to fly, then the only thing they have left is fight. And like us, like us, one thing is that they will watch you and they will see what you do. And if it's something that looks good to them, they'll repeat it. If it's something they don't like, they will not do it. So modeling is when you see somebody else do something and you pretend to be like them. Vicarious learning is when you see somebody they're playing with fire or something. And you, I'm not going to do that. That's vicarious learning. They do both. So what you think you know ain't necessarily so, is it, Pippa? Now, here's another one. Snowball. He's a guy. You know, he's been DNA tested. We know he's a guy. He was actually Chloe's guy for five years before he became made aggressive, which happens with, with males. Uh, male cockatoos in captivity. What's the matter? You need to go to the bathroom? You need to poop? Thought so. Okay. I've learned her signals too. She won't just poop on you. When people tell me that birds poop on them, I wonder, well, what are you training your birds to do? Because they normally won't do that. Hi, Pip. Oh, you looking at Steve Jobs? Are you? Pippa. 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 Pip, Pip. Pip, Pip. Interesting. But he's a guy, right? So sometimes when you're, you're, he's sitting by me in the aviary or he's sitting on my lap here and you're just petting his head, he'll start vibrating like a female. That's not the kind of behavior you expect from a male. Um, but again, they're individuals and they have different ways of working in the world, don't they? Mm -hmm. Hello. So they're constantly, hi peaches, hi baby. They're constantly surprised. Well, Bob's not in here. You want to come over? Let's go get Peach. Let's go get the Peach. She wants to come over. She can. Come on, Peach. You can come over now. Bob's not in here. I was hoping he could stay, but he just refused. He was just, he was going to keep going after her no matter what I did, so. Sometimes that's all you can do is separate them. Now, if I didn't have the cameras on, I wouldn't have put him away. I can't do a video and micromanage his every look and behavior. So now for the longest time, I thought Sugar was just not a cuddler. She didn't like to cuddle. But now she's, oh, don't step in the poop. Don't step in the poop. Come here. <laughs> well done. <laughs> this one has a problem stepping in the poop. <laughs> yes, you do. All right, cool, cool. She won't bother you, Peach. You got on your beak there, kid. It's all right. That, those are my glasses. You don't need to eat them. Lucy Lou. And these two, I'm still learning their behaviors. And, uh, right, Pip? Right, Pip? And shaping them, you know, giving them different environments and... Pip's going a long way. She didn't have many feathers. She was pretty chewed up. And she's doing better. She doesn't hold me quite so tight as she used to. You can still kind of feel your the, the blood in your thumb when she holds on to you. Where originally when she grabbed a hold of you, there was <laughs> it was really tight. 
wasn't it? It's still a little hard to get off, but as you can see, it's not it's not that tight. Before it was clamped down and kind of like they clamped down on a perch when they sleep, really hard to get apart. I'm going to be using, while we're talking about this today, I'm going to be using a technique where I learned from an Applied Behavior Analysis podcast that's used with children who are autistic and appears to be quite effective. The technique has a fancy name. It's called Non-Contingent Reinforcement with Extinction. Non-contingent means that you're going to give a treat either on a schedule or just erratically here and there regardless of whatever they do. In other words, it's not contingent on anything. Technically, it's not reinforcement because you're not reinforcing any behavior. You're not giving it at the exact time that they're doing something that you want. Instead, you're getting their interest, you're holding their interest by giving them a treat occasionally. Um, and it won't work for tomorrow. It's only gonna work for today. You're not teaching them anything. You're just keeping their attention, okay? So you're going to give them this treat here and there. You'll see a lot more positive behaviors when you do this. Don't expect it to change tomorrow's behavior. It's only for today. The reason it's called non-contingent reinforcement with extinction, and the extinction part means that you're not going to be paying attention to minor behaviors. You're just going to give them that treat occasionally to keep their attention. Now, the people who had Chloe initially, they, they tried all kinds of things. Uh, a vet who, <coughs> who died, actually, and that's no longer with us, but they tried different kinds of medicine and, I mean, lots of different stuff. Um, they didn't try Haldol, but it wasn't really well known at that time anyway. But um, they couldn't get her to stop chewing her feathers, and they finally were just done, and they wanted to get rid of her. Um, but now, as you can see, You've seen her, she's in good feather condition. I would have had her in here, but um, Bob was in here and she and Bob don't get along. So again, if the cameras aren't in here, that's not a problem. I can get them in the same room and I can deal with it. Uh, as with Chloe, you think you know what they'll eat. And you know, we're talking three years, she wouldn't touch millet, had no interest in it. Gets it offered to her by somebody at the Renaissance Fair and she's eating it. Okay, um, it took with, with sugar to get her to eat a decent mash, took two and a half years. So don't give up. I mean, the person, you, they, they will change and they do change. But um, one of the hardest things to change is the diet. And if you think your bird will not eat something, remember Chloe and the millet. It may take three years, but uh, not that millet's the greatest thing for him, but you say your bird won't eat pellets. Well, you don't really know if your bird will eat pellets. Chloe eats them. Uh, Coco doesn't. She doesn't eat pellets unless I cook. You know, what I do is I don't cook the pellets, but I, I uh, blend the pellets and mix it into a mash, and then she eats that mash. But she can't eat hard things. So, yeah, she eats pine nuts, but she gets that soft pine nut out there, and she'll eat papaya, anything that's soft, because she has a damaged crop. Um... Some of these breeders put tubes down their throat and then they don't check the temperature of the food. And once that esophagus is damaged and the crop is damaged, it's not gonna heal. The scar tissue makes it so they can't eat normally. Right, Coco? Right, Coco? Now this is unusual behavior. I, you know, this is like the, the, the 2%. She would normally not sit on my lap if I had stopped petting her. She'll walk off, she'll climb up on a perch and then Whenever I look at her, she'll turn her head away. That's how she usually deals with it. But, again, how much can you actually know your parrot? Right, Coco? And we have a tendency to think of 
birds and people and whatever animals around us is cast in stone that you're not expecting them to change, don't think that way because change will happen. Um, Pippa used to fly into that poster every time we did a video. She doesn't do it every time. Now it's maybe one in four times she's in the room. She'll go after that poster. Right, Pip? Right, Pip? Pip, Pip? Someday she may surprise me by saying something. But you know, since she was, since she actually had lead poisoning, it's not likely, but she, she could. Couldn't you? Couldn't you, Pip? Pip, 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 Pip. So we know that their personalities are going to change over time, so we try to be a force for good change. And that's where learning reward training and some of the other tools who apply behavior analysis can make their lives better and your life better. And it helps you to learn a little bit about what they may or may not do. What, Peach? What'd you say, Peach? Why are you eating my glasses? What is it you want? What do you want, Lucy? Now, if you had told me that Lucy was going to get up and sit with her beak against my head for most of the time she was in here, I would have told you you were crazy because that's not the way she usually does things. But she's doing it now. So, what ways might you get to know your parrot better? Well, one is studying. You can read the manual of parrot behavior. Not the easiest book to get through, but if you want the truth, it's an excellent book that is written by experts. Um, you can learn about their bodies with the Basaba Manual for Citizen Birds. The only vet veterinary manual I know of that's written strictly for parrots. Um, Clinical Avian Medicine does deal with parrots, but it also has hornbills and you name it. Ostriches, you know, it does deal with everything, so... Um, probably not the best book for that. The Basaba Manual is a little easier to understand and it just deals with parrots. You can read Animal Training 101 to learn about how to work with them and to... <laughs> little toad, you are messing with my glasses. Does someone want my attention? Lucy, do you want my attention? That's okay. You can sit up there. I don't mind. It's okay. So ways you can learn is, you know, the book learning side of it. Um, then there's, you can take safe short trips, you know, put them in a harness, take them out with you. Uh, the aviator harness is great. Take them out for short trips, like a little, if you have a little, uh, a park you can take them to. If there's dogs, you got to be careful though. Be sure to keep them in a harness when they're out and about though. Even, I don't believe in cutting their wings, but even if you trim their wings, um, they should be in a harness when they're out and about. Because a bird that is clipped can still fly, it just can't fly well. Which means it can't fly back to you if it wants to. It's not going to be confident in its flight. Um, you can try spending time with them in different places in the home at different times of day too. You know, sitting and playing a game with them. Some of these little games you play with kids, like the ones that have the little rings that you drop over the pegs, that kind of thing. You can try doing that. And then, if, even if they don't show much interest, you can try doing that like once a week. Keep trying and trying. You'll be surprised. The, the change in behavior will be like Chloe with the millet, okay? All of a sudden, you'll see a day when they, they show an interest. Are you going to grab my glasses the whole time? Are you? What do you want? You must want something. You want to go on a perch? Pretty bird? Pretty bird? You need to go to the bathroom? Do you need to go to the bathroom? Do you want to go to the bathroom? Usually if she's doing something like this to me, I mean, not that she's ever done this, well, you want to sit up there, that's fine. I'm not trying to get rid of you. I just need to know if you need to go to the bathroom. She, oops, oops, sorry. Sorry, you need to go to the bathroom? Here, go on. All right, that's what she needed to do. Come on. Back up on the shoulder. Oops, oops, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Back up on the shoulder. There you go. There you go. You okay? All right. That's okay. It's a good girl. 
I thought you had to go. I didn't want you sitting there having to go. Yeah. It's all right, baby. So but by trying things for a long period of time, not just giving up, I've had people tell me that they've tried to feed them pellets for a month or so and then just gave up. A month is not going to do it for a lot of these birds. If you were raised on Snickers bars, trying to get you to eat decent food for a year might not work. You're still going to be sneaking Snickers bars and not wanting to eat anything else. Right, Coco? But after a while, like this one, she was raised on peanut butter, oats, and banana. So I have to put a little bit of peanut butter on the end of a syringe, and then I give her mash in the syringe. And that's because of her crop. What are you doing, you silly? Now, see, I never expect you'd want me to. She would want to be a scarf for me. Now, are you my scarf? Hi, Lorelai. Hi, pretty girl. Hi, pretty girl. I would never guess you'd be my scarf. So part of the fun is the fact that they're not going to remain the same, that you're not going to know everything about them, and there's always going to be an adventure there to learn what they're like today. And they may go for a long time where you think they aren't changing. That probably means you're not paying attention. I like to use that line from the movie Shadowlands, where Deborah Winger looks at Anthony Hopkins and says, so what do you do? Walk around with your eyes closed? Because in a lot of ways we do. And this one who came here so shy and retiring and now she's just a little, give me what I want. Take, take charge girl, aren't you? Aren't you a take charge girl? And this one would never have thought of just grabbing my glasses. When she came here, and now she grabs my glasses while I'm talking. Don't step in the poop. Now you're better at not doing that than the others. What's up, Lorelei? Oh, you want to get the track pad? Oh, probably not. Probably not. Right, Lorelei? Lorelei. Baby girl. Baby girl. Baby girl? Coco? So, Lorelei. You want to say goodbye to the people? Come here, Lorelei. You want to say goodbye to the people? Say goodbye, everybody. <laughs> say goodbye. See you next time. It is ignorance of Bob's nature that turned Babalu into a living gargoyle. Bob's would-be parents made a hasty choice and found themselves in living hell, torn between guilt and frustration. I have seen the joy in Babalu's eyes now that he has a new life with me as his companion. To see Babalu love and trust again is worth the effort of a lifetime. But once again, Bob is heading toward the pain of separation. My heart nearly broke the day I discovered that he was heading toward a cloacal prolapse, that his life will be cut short. To find love and acceptance and then have it stolen away from you by failing health is too much to bear. We can slow the progress of his failing health, but we can't stop it. He will need several surgeries and eventually Babalu will die. We want to give him the best possible life until that day. His surgeries will become progressively more expensive over time. Won't you please lend Babalu a hand and donate to his medical fund today? Our donation button is on our webpage at www.chloesanctuary.org. Just be sure to say, for Bob in the notes when you donate. We welcome your feedback on our videos. We look forward to your insights, tips, questions, stories, and pictures. You can email us at 
cockatude at chloesanctuary.org. Reach us on Twitter at sign Chloe Sanctuary. And join with us on our Facebook Chloe Sanctuary page. So science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower.